A very good evening aspirants. Welcome to the Hindu newspaper analysis brought to you by Shankar IAS Academy. Today's date is 5th of December 2022. So displayed here are the list of news articles that we are going to discuss today. As we already said, today we have chosen 8 different news articles from different editions of newspaper. So without much delay, let's get into the news article discussion. Now we'll take a look at this text and context article. So from the title itself, I hope you can understand what is this article is talking about. It says that China convened the first China Indian Ocean Region Forum in the Chinese city of Kanming. See this meeting was organized by China International Development Corporation Agency that is in short called as CIDCA. Know that this agency is China's top development aid agency. So this is the crux of the news article given here. So in this context, let us understand about China Indian Ocean Region Forum. The countries who have attended the forum, China's plan for the Indian Ocean Region and finally India's stand. Now before that, the syllabus relevant to this news article is highlighted here for your reference. You can just go through it. So now let's start our discussion with China Indian Ocean Region Forum. See this forum is the first high level official development cooperation forum jointly held by China and countries in the Indian Ocean region. The purpose of the forum includes first is to establish a marine disaster prevention system then to establish a mitigation cooperation mechanism. Now these systems and mechanisms are to be established between China and countries in the Indian Ocean region. And some of the other purposes include strengthening policy coordination, deepening development cooperation, increasing resilience to shocks and disasters, enhancing relative countries' capacity to obtain economic benefits through use of marine resources like fishes, renewable energy, tourism and shipping in a sustainable way. So these are all the objectives or aim or purposes of the forum. So on the China side, it is telling that this forum was established to aid the development of the countries in the Indian Ocean region. This is reflected in the forum's theme which is called as shared development theory and practice from the perspective of the blue economy. But we all know this is just the notebook objective, right? See the real objective is to counter the India's influence in the Indian Ocean region and the article says that this China Indian Ocean region forum is a counter move to the India backed organizations like Indian Ocean Rim Association, IORA, then security and growth for all in the region that is Sahar and etc. So, so far we saw about the forum and its objectives. Now let us see who are all attending and backing the forum. See, according to China, the forum was attended by high-level representatives and senior officials from 19 countries. They include Indonesia, Pakistan, Myanmar, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Maldives, Nepal, Afghanistan, Iran, Oman, South Africa, Kenya, Mozambique, Tanzania, Sicilus, Madagascar, Mauritius, Djibouti and Australia. But remember out of these 19 countries, two of them said that they did not participate the forum officially. Those two countries are Australia and Maldives. They both said that there was no official representation by both countries in the forum. But both were attending the forum in their individual capacity. They also said that participation by individuals do not constitute official representation. So knowing these informations, now let's come to China's plans for Indian Ocean region. See very clearly the forum has underlined China's interest in the Indian Ocean region, right? Now Indian Ocean region is very important to China. It is because China is already a major trading partner for most of the countries in the region. Apart from this, major sea routes that are vital to China's economic interest lies in the region. And for these reasons only, China is keen on establishing its power in Indian Ocean region. It is seen in many activities of China. For example, the CIDCA forum itself. It is the latest initiative that reflects the China's view of Indian Ocean region. It is clear that it want to control the Indian Ocean region. So the author is saying that don't get surprised if there are many initiatives like this in the future. 
Apart from this, during a visit to Sri Lanka this year, China's foreign minister proposed creating a forum. And this forum will be focused on the development of Indian Ocean island countries. And its main aim is to build consensus and synergy and promote common development. So these are some of the diplomatic moves of China. Adding to this, China is establishing a more frequent military presence in the waters of the Indian Ocean region. As we all know, Beijing's first ever overseas naval military facility was set up in Djibouti near the Horn of Africa. Beijing has acquired the Hambantota port in Sri Lanka on a 99-year lease. It is building the port in Pakistan at Gwadar in the Arabian Sea. Now, all these ports give China easy access to India's western coast. And we all know China is making infrastructure investment in the Maldives. And as we can see in the news often, Chinese military ships, tracking vessels and submarines are visiting these ports and establishments in the Indian Ocean region with greater frequency. The recent example is the docking of Yuan Wong 5 at the Sri Lanka's Hammantota port. See, it is a high-tech ship for tracking objects even in space. In simple words, it is a military tracking vessel. And what is it doing in Indian Ocean? This is concerning, right? And one more concerning thing is the statement released by Chinese military planners. They said that the PLA Navy has a long-term plan to deploy six aircraft carriers to secure China's maritime interests. And they also said that two of them will be based in the Indian Ocean region. So these actions reflect China's plan regarding the Indian Ocean region. It is very clear that China wants to increase its hold and power in the Indian Ocean region. Now finally coming to the India stand. See India has condemned the action of China both personally and in the international forums. Already we are having land border dispute with China. Now this increased presence of China in the Indian Ocean region is definitely a threat to India's maritime sovereignty. Here India has the IORA, it is already an established platform in the region because it is an intergovernmental organization which was established in the year 1997 itself. IORA has 23 members. See most of the countries that attend a China Indian Ocean region forum are members of IORA and IORA has 10 dialogue partners. Some of the major countries include China, Japan, Russia, the UK and the USA. So India can use this IORA to support its cause. And the cause is to make Indian Ocean region independent of external influences. If that fails, we have Vision Sahar. See, it is nothing but the security and growth for all in the region. It was introduced by PM Modi in the year 2015 in UNSC. Its main aim is to focus on cooperative measures for sustainable use of the oceans. The mission also provides a framework for a safe, secure and stable maritime domain in the region. Under this vision, Sahar only, Mission Shahar was launched in the year 2020. It was India's initiative to deliver COVID-19 related assistance to the countries in the Indian Ocean region. So by doing such initiatives, India can gain the support of littoral countries of Indian Ocean. If this also fails, we have Indian Navy backed Indian Ocean Naval Symposium. Now this is a task for you. Go and read about the symposium and comment what you have read. So that's all you have to know about this news article discussion. And as Sun Tzu, who was a Chinese military general and philosopher says, if you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles. So knowing about our kind neighbor's strategy is very important. That is why we have chosen this news article. As we saw earlier in a lot of our news article discussions, China is already weaponizing trade and it is devaluating its own currency to boost exports. And to dump it in other country, it need maritime link. So to secure its maritime interest, even though there are forums like IORA and Sahar, China is creating its own forum called China Indian Ocean Region Forum. So for this also, India has to get ready to retaliate. So these are some of the important points that you have to remember. So these learned points, now let us move on to the next news article discussion.
Now this news article mentions about the rising pollution level in the national capital. The pollution level has entered the severe category. So the center's air quality panel has directed the authorities to take actions under the Greater Response Action Plan, in short called as GRAP. So what is this plan? See, it is an emergency response action plan. It is invoked with a view to arrest further deterioration of advanced air quality scenario in the national capital region or NCR. Under this plan, actions are initiated towards the abatement of air pollution in NCR. This means whenever the air quality in NCR is affected, actions listed under this plan are done. Okay? So if you are asking me why such a plan is needed, it is because we have heard many times there is high level of air pollution in Delhi and other parts of NCR. Particularly in winter season, the air quality is affected due to smog caused by stubble burning in adjoining states. During this time, the level of pollutants like particulate matter concentration that is PM 2.5 and PM 10 goes much beyond the prescribed standards for ambient air quality. So, based on the recommendations of Central Pollution Control Board, GRAP was notified in January 2017. It was notified by the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change. Previously, GRAP was implemented through Environment Pollution Prevention and Control Authority for the NCR, but the authority was dissolved and from 2021 onwards, the GRAP is being implemented by the Commission for Air Quality Management in NCR and adjoining area, in short called as CAQM. And recently, GRAP was revised by CAQM. One of the major changes was previously GRAP was enforced based only on the concentration of PM 2.5 and PM 10. This year, GRAP is being enforced based on the air quality index. GRAP is basically classified under four different stages of adverse air quality in Delhi. Stage 1 is poor category. This will be when the air quality is between 201 to 300. Then, in stage 2, air quality index ranges between 301 to 400. This is the very poor category. Next is the severe category, which is the stage 3. This is when the air quality index is between 401 to 450. Then the final stage is stage 4, which is severe plus category. It is invoked when the air quality index is more than 450. Here note that different actions are listed for these different stages. Now as per news, the air quality index is 447 that is more than 450. Hence stage 4 is invoked which is a serious plus category. Stage 4 is a disruptive stage of restrictions and impacts a large number of stakeholders and public at large. Under this, children, elderly and those with certain chronic diseases are advised to avoid outdoor activities. So if you are asking me what actions are taken under this severe plus category, first is stopping the entry of truck traffic into Delhi and also a ban is implemented on traveling in certain vehicles. You know that exception is given to those vehicles that carry essential commodities or provides essential services. Next action is closing down all industries in NCR. Exception is provided to industries like milk and dairy units etc. Then a ban is imposed on construction and demolition activities in highways, roads, flyways, power transmission, pipelines etc. There is also provision to reduce the working strength to 50% in public, municipal and private offices. By implementing these actions, it is expected that the air quality scenario can improve. So in this news article discussion, we saw in detail about a region specific emergency response action plan which is called as graded response action plan. Now I am introducing this plan to you because any region in India for any issue such a region specific plan can be formulated. So these learned points now let us move on to the next news article discussion. Now look at this news article. This news article talks about Down syndrome. Now it is a news because the day before yesterday Tamil Nadu chief minister has inaugurated the annual general meeting of Asia Pacific Down syndrome federation. And in this conference, a group of doctors from various countries who have knowledge of Down syndrome has participated. And on the first day of the conference, the doctors discussed about the standardization of medical passports. See here, this medical passports refers to a compilation of medical history of persons with a Down syndrome. 
it includes protocols for treatment and postnatal counseling so this is the crux of the news article given here in this background let us briefly understand about down syndrome its types and its symptoms so to begin with what is down syndrome see down syndrome is a chromosomal disorder in which a person is born with an extra chromosome as we all know the chromosome or small packages of genes present in the cells of our body and these chromosomes only shape and function a baby's body when the baby's body develops during pregnancy and after birth usually a baby is born with 46 chromosomes in which 23 are inherited from the mother and 23 are inherited from the father but know that a person with down syndrome may contain 47 chromosomes the chromosome 21 pair will have an extra copy which will make the number as 47 now this additional genetic material causes physical and developmental characteristics associated with down syndrome so having this basic idea now let us see about the types of down syndrome see there are three types of down syndrome the first type is called trisomy 21 See it is the most common type and it affects approximately 95% of people with down syndrome. In this type of down syndrome each cell in the body has three copies of chromosome 21 instead of usual two copies of chromosome 21. That is in each cell in the body there will be an extra copy of chromosome 21 apart from the two pairs of chromosome 21. Okay? Then the second type is called translocation down syndrome. See it is caused when a part or a whole extra chromosome 21 is attached or translocated to another chromosome. Know that here the chromosome 21 is attached to another chromosome rather than being a separate chromosome. I think you can appreciate the difference between the two. And the final type is called mosaic down syndrome. It is the least common type. here only some of the cells in the body have an extra copy of chromosome 21 and not every cells okay so these are all the types of down syndrome and know that the effects of each type are usually similar so what are the symptoms see babies with down syndrome have specific trait and development issues there are a few abnormalities and the most common one is that the person is having abnormal facial features which is popularly known as dysmorphic features then the down syndrome patients usually have upslanted eyes that is the eyes are slanted upwards then they also have flat nose then unusually form ears and short height neck and hands then the muscle tone of down syndrome patient is weak which results in sitting difficulties then the iq of down syndrome patients is in borderline which is between 50 to 70 know that normal babies have an iq of about 75 to 80 also know that about 40 to 45 percent age down syndrome patients have congenital heart disease and they also face eyesight problems and hearing loss So these are all some of the important points that you have to know about down syndrome. So with these learned points now let us move on to the next news article discussion. Now look at this news article. It talks about Etimoga mud flat. The news is that Etimoga mud flat has become a prime winter stopover for many central asian migrant bird species. So this is the crux of the news article given here. In this context let us learn about Etimoga mud flats. First of all what are mud flats? See mud flats refers to the land which is located near a water body that is regularly flooded by tides or rivers. Mud flats are also known as tidal flats and they are formed upon the deposition of mud by such tides or rivers. Know that mud flats are usually barren. This means that there is usually no vegetation in the mud flats the mud flats usually occur in sheltered areas of the coast like bays lagoons estuaries etc note that most of the sedimented area of the mud flats falls within the intertidal zone so the mud flats experiences submersion under water twice in a year so this is in brief about mud flats now let us understand about etimoga mud flat See Etimoga mudflat is one of the last surviving mudflats on the eastern coastline of India. 
it is situated in the kaki nada bay which falls under the andhra pradesh state know that the etimoka mud flat is spread over of about 500 hectares and it is located adjacent to the koringa wildlife sanctuary of andhra pradesh also know that the etimoga mud flat is a continuation of the kumba pishegam mud flat see this mud flat also falls in the kaki nada bay know that in recent years the kumba pishegam mud flat has been raised to make way for port based projects so this is about the etimoga mud flat so with this basic understanding now let us see few points mentioned in the news article see the news article says that the etimoga mud flat has emerged as india's prime destination for the endangered great knot see this november a flock of nearly 450 great knots has been sighted on the mud flat so now we shall see in brief about great knot see great knot is a medium sized shore bird see it is a migratory bird that travels long distances they breed in eastern siberia and during their migration to australia they stop over etimoga mudland in andhra pradesh remember this great knot is placed under the category of endangered in the iucn red list of threatened species now coming back to the news article the news article says that etimoga mud flat is a major winter stopover for 34 species of migratory birds on the east coast it hosts a significant number of migratory birds which includes the ringed great knots from russia and china and apart from this a small flock of eurasian curlews are also spotted in etimoga mud flats now i am exposing you to all these names just to help you to know that all these are birds and they do exist so these learned points now let us move on to the next news article discussion now this is also a text and context article which explains about e rupee Five days ago, on our 30th November Hindu newspaper analysis, we saw that RBI announced the first pilot for the retail version of the e-rupee from December 1, 2022. Right? To know about the details of the pilot version, you can watch the 30th November analysis. But today, we'll focus on the basics of e-rupee. Before that, the syllabus relevant to this news article is highlighted here for your reference. You can go through it. So, what is this e-rupee? E rupee is nothing but the digital rupee. The digital rupee is the central bank digital currency of India. Here, when I say digital currency, it simply refers to any means of payment that exists purely in the electronic form. Since it is an electronic form, the digital money is not tangible like a physical note or a coin. It exists virtually. Therefore, we are not wrong to call it as the virtual money. so when such digital currency or money represents fiat currencies it is called cbdc i hope you all know about fiat money it is a government issued money but it is not backed by a physical commodity like gold or silver so the cbdc represents fiat currencies like dollars or euros or in case of india it represents the indian rupee now remember it is the same rupee but in the digital form So if you ask me will the features of physical rupee be present in its digital form that is e rupee yes of course let me list out the features of e rupee see rupee is commonly accepted medium of exchange in india it means individuals can sell their products for rupee and use this money to purchase the commodities which they need now this is possible because rupee has the legal tender status in india Legal tender means the coin or a bank note that is legally tenderable for discharge of debt or obligation. In other words, such a coin or bank note cannot be refused by any citizen of the country for the settlement of any kind of transaction. Now, in case of CBDC, that is e rupee, it is also issued by RBI as the legal tender, but in a digital form. So, it can also be accepted as a medium of exchange in India. you can use it for both person to person transactions and person to merchant transactions now the next is the concept of store of value see a store of value is an asset currency or commodity that maintain its value over a long period since money is not perishable its storage cost are also considerably lower and it is also accepted to anyone at any point of time 
that is why we say money act as a store of value for individuals so money can be retrieved at a later date without losing its value since rupee has store of value the e rupee which is just the digital form of the rupee also has store of value so apart from this the other notable features of e rupee includes firstly you will be holding the e rupee electronically in a digital wallet like how you hold cash in physical wallets the digital wallet will be offered by the participating banks and it is stored on mobile phones the digital wallet will be overseen by the rbi and the rbi will issue digital currency in the same denominations that paper currency and coins are issued also the deposits held in bank can be converted into digital rupees and vice versa and fourthly and most importantly in the era of pandemic caused by infection there is need for contactless transactions and this e rupee can facilitate it so these are some of the features of e rupee so with this basic understanding i would also like to point out that e rupee has several advantages over physical form of rupee Firstly CBDCs will provide the benefits of virtual currencies and at the same time it will also ensure consumer protection this is because now the consumers need not rely on the volatile private virtual currencies like cryptocurrencies so here note that CBDCs are different from cryptocurrencies particularly CBDCs are sovereign backed alternatives to virtual currencies Secondly with e rupee there is no need for physical cash management and e rupee is economical to produce when compared to physical cash notes so the operational cost will drastically reduce thirdly unlike the physical currency e rupee cannot be lost it cannot get torn burnt or physically damaged this means the lifeline of a digital currency will be indefinite compared to the physical notes Fourthly we know that the government is dealing with the menace of unaccounted money for a longer period of time right but since the e rupee transactions can happen only online it will make it easier for governments to have access to all such transactions happening within the authorized networks now apart from this when the government has access to transactions and knows how money leaves and enters the country this will allow it to create a space for better budgeting and economic plans for the future and above all e rupee is a big step towards india's transition towards a cashless society so based on these advantages now e rupee is launched on a pilot basis so it will be offered only by a select group of public and private banks and only in few major cities but is the e rupee without any concerns it is not so experts believe that e rupee could disrupt the banking system so yesterday we saw a news article in which the deputy governor of rbi said that the fintechs are not replacing the banks and it is a misconception to think like that now e rupee is also a fintech but it is actually disrupting the banking system if you are asking me how i think you know that the deposits we hold in banks plays a major part in providing loans right but if the cash is converted into digital currencies by the consumers then the amount of available cash with the banks will reduce so they will not have enough money to lend but it is expected that even this issue will be sorted in the future so that is all you have to know about this news article in this news article discussion we saw in detail about what is this e rupee what are its features and what are the advantages it has when compared to physical currency so with these learnt points now let us move on to the next news article discussion now look at this news article this news article says that the major oil producing countries led by saudi arabia and russia agreed yesterday to maintain their current output levels they decided to stick to the course which is production cut of 2 million barrels per day until the end of 2023 so this is the crux of the news article given here since we could frequently see in the newspaper regarding the disruption of oil import and export knowing about opec is very important so what is this opec see opec stands for organization of the petroleum exporting countries it is a permanent intergovernmental organization it was created at the badat conference in the year 1960 it was created by the resolutions of the conference of the representatives of the governments of iran iraq kuwait 
Saudi Arabia and Venezuela. So these five countries are the founding members of the organization and some more countries later joined the organization. They include Qatar, Indonesia, the United Arab Emirates, Algeria, Nigeria, Ecuador, Gabon, Angola, Equatorial Guinea and Congo. So out of these 11 countries, Qatar, Indonesia, Ecuador are no longer members of OPEC. So the founding members plus the 8 members that later joined OPEC together form the members of OPEC. So this means that currently the organization has a total of 13 member countries. So these are the information regarding the history of formation of the organization OPEC. Now coming to its objectives. See the principal aim of the organization is the coordination and unification of the petroleum policies of member countries. Secondly, its objective is to determine the best means for safeguarding their interest individually and collectively. Thirdly, their aim is to derive ways and means of ensuring the stabilization of prices in international oil markets. This is to be done with a view of eliminating harmful and unnecessary fluctuations. Fourthly, its objective is to give due regards to the interest of the producing nations and to secure a steady income to the producing countries. Apart from this, its objective is to give an efficient economic and regular supply of petroleum to consuming nations. And finally, its objective is to give a fair return to those investing in the petroleum industry. So that's all regarding this new article discussion. In this new article discussion, we saw in detail about OPEC, its members and its core objectives. So these learned points. Now let us move on to the next news article discussion. Now look at this news article. This news article says that the Telangana chief minister has accused the centre government saying that the centre government is hindering the progress of Telangana by denying the due devolution of taxes to the states. So in this backdrop, let us understand what is this tax devolution and the 15th Finance Commission's recommendation on tax devolution. So first of all, what is this tax devolution? It is nothing but a portion of net proceeds of the center taxes that are awarded to the states. In simple words, it is an amount of money that are given to the states from the central government's taxes and duties. See, as we all know, Article 280 of the Constitution deals with Finance Commission. One of the core tasks of a Finance Commission under Article 280 is to make recommendations regarding the distribution of the net proceeds of taxes between the Union and the states. So based on this Article 281 only, the 15th Finance Commission was constituted in 2017 by the President of India. And the 15th Finance Commission recommended about the tax devolution between the Union and the states. Remember in tax devolution you have to know about two terms that is vertical devolution and horizontal devolution. Here vertical devolution means the distribution of the net proceeds of taxes between the union and the states. And the horizontal devolution means the allocation of the respective shares of such tax proceeds between different states. So with this understanding, now let us see about the recommendations of the 15th Finance Commission regarding tax devolution. First, let us see about the recommendations regarding vertical devolution that is the distribution between the center and the states. See, the commission recommended to maintain the vertical devolution of 41 percentage. This means that in the central taxes, the share of states is recommended to be 41 percentage. And this is for the 2021 to 26 period. Know that this is less than the 42 percentage share recommended by the 14th Finance Commission for the duration of 2015 to 20. Also note that the adjustment of 1% is provided for the newly formed union territories of Jammu and Kashmir and Ladakh. And this 1% is given from the resources of the center. Okay. Now coming to the horizontal devolution that is distribution between the states. See the distribution between the states is made based on certain criteria. Know that the finance commission has recommended 6 criteria to determine each state's share in central taxes. Note that there is also weightage assigned for each criterion. In this table given here, the criteria and the respective weightage are listed out. Pause the video and kindly go through it. So this we came to the end of this news article discussion. In this news article discussion, we saw in detail about tax devolution and the recommendation of 15th Finance Commission. 
So these learned points now let us move on to the next news article discussion. Now have a look at this news article. This news article talks about a RT query. The news is that IIT Madras has replied to a query under the Right to Information Act. In its reply, the IIT Madras informed that the representation of faculty members belonging to the scheduled caste and the scheduled tribe categories is only 19, which is just about 3 percentage compared to the strength of open competition that is OC and other backward classes OBC category teachers. So this is the crux of the news article given here. In this context, let us understand the procedure and processes involved in the RTI. As we all know, the Right to Information Act 2005 has established the necessary practical regime of right to information. It was established to empower citizens to take charge by participating in decision making. And it was introduced to empower citizens by challenging corrupt and arbitrary actions at all levels. Apart from this, it also helps the citizens to evaluate the government since citizens are given access to government records through RTI. So in today's discussion, let us understand the procedure involved in this RTI. Remember, one can seek information under RTI Act 2005 from any public authority. That is any government organization or government aided organization. Okay. So what are all the rules or guidelines involved for filing RTI? Firstly, application can be handwritten or typed. Secondly, the application should be submitted in English or Hindi or it can also be in the official language of the area in which the application is made. Thirdly, the application should have the information like the name and office address of assistant public information officer that is APIO or public information officer that is PIO. Then it should have the subject where we have to specify the information needed from the public authority. Then it should have the applicant name, their category that is SC, ST or OBC, then the application fee. Note that there is no need of uh, uploading other card or PAN card or any other personal information. Only thing required is BPL card or below poverty line card. Then finally the postal address and applicant sign is also necessary. After filling the first page, the applicant has to click on make payment to make payment of the prescribed fee. The payment can be made through either internet banking or using credit or debit card of master or visa or using rupee card. After making payment an application can be submitted and note that citizen who is BPL is not required to pay any RTI fee. So on submission of an application a unique registration number would be issued. This may be referred by the applicant for any references in the future. So now coming to the question what happens if this application is not responded within 30 days or what if it is rejected by the PAO? For that you have to submit first appeal application. This is to be submitted within 30 days of the due date of the information to be received. And there is no submission fee for this first appeal. But if you think the information after this first appeal is incomplete or if you are not satisfied then you can file the second appeal. Okay. So these are all the procedures that are involved while filing an RTI. So these learned points now let us move on to the next part of the news article discussion which is the preliminary practice question discussion. Now look at this first question. This question is about OPEC which among the following are the members of the organization of the petroleum exporting countries that is OPEC. First one is Qatar, then Saudi Arabia, then Iran and Iraq. So here you have to choose the correct answer. Option A 1, 2 and 3 only. Option B 2, 3 and 4 only. Option C 1, 2 and 4 only. And option D 1, 2, 3 and 4. See the correct answer for the question is option B 2, 3 and 4 only. See Qatar is the odd one out here. Qatar was a member of OPEC but it terminated its membership on 1st January 2019. The other three are the founding members of OPEC. Totally there are five founding members. We saw that in the discussion itself right. Now if you can recall it and choose the correct answer. The correct answer for this question is option B 2, 3 and 4 only. Now moving on this question is about Down syndrome. Let me rewrite the first statement. It is a chromosomal disorder in which a person is born with a deficient chromosome. See this statement is actually incorrect. Down syndrome is a chromosomal disorder in which a person is born with an extra chromosome. Here a person with Down syndrome contains 47 chromosome. 
that is an extra copy of chromosome 21 okay so this statement is incorrect now moving on the second statement says that the intelligent quotient of the person who's having down syndrome disorder is higher than the normal person see this is also incorrect we saw in the discussion itself the IQ of Down syndrome patients is in borderline between 50 to 70 whereas the normal babies have an IQ of about 75 to 80. So the correct answer for this question is option D neither 1 nor 2. Now moving on this question is about GRAP. Consider the following statements with reference to the greater response action plan for NCR. Statement 1, it is implemented by the Commission for Air Quality Management in NCR and adjoining areas CAQM and Statement 2, it is enforced based only on the concentration of PM 2.5 and PM 10. Here, the first statement is actually correct. We saw that in the discussion itself. Now, statement 2 is incorrect because the older version of GRAP was enforced based only on the concentration of PM 2.5 and PM 10. But this year, GRAB is being enforced based on the air quality index which takes other pollutants also into account. Like uh, this includes ozone, sulfur dioxide and oxides of nitrogen. So the correct answer for this question is option B because statement 2 is alone incorrect here. Now moving on, look at this question about finance commission. It is a statutory body functioning under the ministry of finance. This statement is incorrect because finance commission is a constitutional body. It will be formed time to time by the president of India. The main task of the finance commission is to give suggestions on center state financial relations. Now look at the statement too. It gives recommendations on the distribution of tax revenues between the union and the states. See this statement is actually correct. The Finance Commission gives its recommendations on distribution of tax revenues between the union. Now look at the third statement. It says that it does not have a mandate to give recommendations on the distribution of tax revenues amongst the states. See this statement is incorrect because the Finance Commission also has a mandate to give recommendations on the distribution of tax revenues amongst the states. So the correct answer for this question is option C. 1 and 3 only. Now moving on the question displayed here is the quiz question for you today. Just go through the question and try to answer it in the comment section. See the questions displayed here are the main practice questions for you today. Just go through the questions. Try to answer it in the comment section. So with this we came to the end of the news article discussion. If you like the video hit like, do comment and don't forget to subscribe to Shankar AES Academy YouTube channel. Now thank you for listening.